132 spots where I can put my fingers on this fretboard, plus the open six strings, which gives us 138 options on the guitar. That's a lot. And with this many options, it's no wonder that most of us just kind of wander around the fretboard completely lost. And listen, I'm not trying to step on any toes here because that was me for years. I got by just knowing a few chords and scale patterns and basically just memorizing as much as I could. But I really do believe there's a better path than just memorizing, one that will help you narrow down the 138 options on the fretboard. So what's this path? It's intervals. We're going to dig into what intervals are and how to use them in a bit. But before we do, I want you to keep your ear out for something. Think back to the opening jam and really think about what intervals maybe I was favoring or leaning toward. Think about that as we go through the intervals, give them names and sounds. And then we're going to come back to that jam and really have some fun with the intervals that I used. So stick with me. But first, let's talk intervals. An interval is the space between two notes. And really everything we do in music relates relates to how much space we put in between the notes, both space and time called rhythm and space in pitch called an interval. We're focusing on the space in pitch, the intervals here. And the first interval that we're going to cover is one that I think of as the container of intervals. It sets the outer bounds for the intervals. Each interval that we're going to talk about today falls within this larger interval called the octave. Let's use this G note as our reference called the root. We'll reference everything from this in this particular lesson, but remember that an interval is a distance between any two notes, so you can move your root and all of this interval discussion holds up. But back to this G. When I play it, it vibrates at a certain frequency. And the note that vibrates exactly twice that is called an octave, and that's our first interval. The octave is also named a G, and that's where the musical alphabet starts over. So that's really why I think of this as a container, right, where all the other notes fall in between. And yes, I know that there are intervals beyond the octave, but that's another discussion. We're going to talk about what's sitting neatly within the octave. So let's take a look at how we can find that on the fretboard. There are 12 half steps in an octave and each fret on the guitar represents a half step musically. So if we just move up 12 frets, we go from this G, just sticking on the same string, sixth string, we have our octave, right? But there are many ways that we can play this shape here. And one of the most convenient ways is to skip a string from our root skip over the fifth string, and then play on the fourth string, but come up two frets. Now, just listen to this. I want you to take a second to really internalize how this octave sounds as we go. And let's find our octave from different G notes around the fretboard, because it's important to understand how the shape changes, sometimes it does, when we move on to different strings. Now, fortunately, if we find the G here on the fifth string, that shape, up to the third string is the same. We skip over the fourth, come up two frets, and we have another G note. But check this out. If we play the G, remember we found that one, it's still a G. If we start there, fifth fret of the fourth string, and skip over a string, and then come up two frets, we've got another octave. No, we don't. That does not sound the same as the others. We have to adjust for the tuning interval of the second string. So when we're crossing onto or over the second string, we've got to make an adjustment and come up one fret. So this is the shape when we contend with the second string. All right. So then if we were to come up to the third fret, skip over, sorry, the third string at the 12th fret, skip over the second string, that same shape, the first shape that we dealt with, won't work there either. We've got to come up because we crossed the second string, and here's our octave shape. And go back and let's listen. Just hear that octave sound, right? It sounds really stable. The notes almost sound the same, but one is clearly higher. There's no dissonance whatsoever. It's clean and very stable. Practice playing the octave on your guitar and really get to know the sound of it and the fretboard shape of it. But I want you to practice recognizing the interval when others play it, when you hear it. And that takes a little bit of practice, but it's helpful to have a few sounds that you've memorized and sort of attached to maybe popular examples. So here's one. Or how about this? The 
first one was from Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song and the second from Rage Against the Machine's Bulls on Parade. And each of these gives us an example of that big wide interval of an octave. Both of them work with the F sharp on the sixth string and the F sharp on the fourth string. They just go in different directions. Immigrant Song up and then Bulls on Parade down. And look, maybe these songs don't really mean anything to you, so you're gonna to wanna to take some time and find examples of an octave interval in songs that are memorable to you. That's gonna make it easier to really internalize that and help you recognize it externally when you hear it. Now let's take a look at two other intervals I'm sure you'll get a ton of mileage from. The major third is extremely important. It's key in defining the overall sound of a chord or a scale, and we're gonna see that in action when we get back to the jam example. But for now, let's make sure that we can find it on the fretboard. Starting from our root note, we can move up four half steps, one, two, three, four, to find our major third. That's moving along one string, also known as two whole steps. But if we want to do that across the strings, which is really helpful for us guitarists, we're going to move up a string and back a fret. So here is our major third shape. Let's do this from the G that's on the fifth string, that's at the 10th fret, and it's the same shape, very similar to our octave, right? It's up a string and down a fret. So there's the major third. Here's the major third from the fourth string. Now, when we go up to our major third interval, starting on the third string, when we move up to the next string, it's not gonna sound quite right because we've got to come up and account for that tuning difference on the second string. So there's our major third. It's just simply barring across the strings there, right? And then if we move up and find our G note on the second string, we can find our major third by dropping, or moving up rather, to the next string, the first string, and then back down a fret, right? So keep in mind, this is a good point to really call out the fact that the second string, it's only when you're crossing onto it that we have to make that adjustment. If we're starting from the second string, we go back to business as usual. So there is our major third sound on strings two and one. Here's my favorite example of a major third. It's Blister in the Sun by the Violent Films, and it's the when I part of the vocals. The first two notes, when I. That really helps me identify the major third. And another great choice to help you identify that is Obla Di, Obla Da by, you guessed it, the Beatles. It's the first two notes, the Obla that give us the major third. And speaking of this song, the next interval that we're gonna cover completes that melody. The perfect fifth. Let's take a look. The perfect fifth has a consonant sound when played against the root, kinda like the octave. The root fifth combo is really good and stable. It actually forms the basic power chord that we use so much in rock music. That's what that A5 and E5 business that you see in tabs are all about. There's really just two note chords, the root and the fifth. Let's spend a minute mapping that out on the fretboard. From our root note, we move up seven half steps for a perfect fifth. That's seven frets on the guitar. Six and seven. So there's our perfect fifth interval, at least along one string. It's very useful to map that out across the strings. If we do that, starting on the sixth string, we end up with this shape. This is our root and fifth interval set here. And you may recognize that. That's the basic power chord shape. If we move that around the fretboard with different string sets, we find that we have the same shape here on these two strings, that's five and four. Same shape on strings four and three. But if we move up here to the 12th fret, just sticking with G note as our reference, then we know we gotta do something because we're encountering that second string. And what do we say? We're gonna raise that note by one fret. So this is the shape. Just getting these other fingers out of the way here so that you can see it's up a string and then up with an extra fret in there. Now, if we play back on a G that starts on the second string, we go back to our regular shape. Remember, it's just when we land on or cross over the second string that we've gotta make that one weird adjustment. It's based on the tuning interval of the third and second string, which by the way, 
is a major third, right? Now, let's do something else, because so far we've been kind of finding intervals that are up the fretboard, this direction, because we're going up in pitch, right? We could also find that same interval in this direction, sort of below or down this way on the fretboard. And I think it really helps to come up so you can see this and we don't encounter any open strings. If we start from this G on the 10th fret of the fifth string, and we want to find a perfect fifth that's this way, we can, we're just going to cross over the fourth string and we go back with this shape. Now that's a bit of a wide stretch. You may want to use your little finger there to play this, but I'm at the 10th fret and the 7th fret. So that is a shape to find your perfect fifth interval. Right? Does not sound the same. It's just a different way to find that interval. And of course we could do it from the fourth string as well, and then we would do that big shape, but look where we're landing on the second string. So what do we have to do? We've got to bring that up, which fortunately makes this a little bit easier to finger, and then we have our root fifth shape that we can use that crosses strings and moves in this direction toward the headstock of the guitar. My favorite example of this interval is definitely one that I'll never forget. It's one by Metallica. And it's actually two pairs of perfect fifths. There's this one, followed by this one. And this one might trip you up a little bit, but if you think about this sort of down the fretboard pattern that we just covered, it's this. It just happens to have an open string. So if I place my finger there over the nut, that's what we're doing, right? two pairs of perfect fifths that I'm not going to forget, but if you need a different example, find one that's memorable and means something to you. Now, before we bring these two intervals together, I want to tell you about a helpful resource that I put together for you called the Fretboard Toolkit. This toolkit is a collection of free lessons and PDFs, things that will help you unlock the fretboard. So if you feel lost on the fretboard, it's definitely going to help you make sense of it so that you can play the music that's in your head. That's really what it's all about. And if you're into that, you want to do that, then grab the the toolkit at the link on the screen or in the description. Now, let's see what we can do with the root and these two other really important intervals that I keep talking about. If we play a root third and fifth together anywhere on the fretboard, we're playing a triad, a three note chord that is very useful. It will help you open up the fretboard and play chords that are beyond just bar chords, power chords, and cowboy chords. So let's find our first triad now. Let's go back to this root that's on the fifth fret of the fourth string. We just need to find a major third and a perfect fifth from here, play them together, and we've got our triad. And we know how to find a major third, that's here, and we also know how to find a perfect fifth, which is here. But we can't play two notes together on the same string at the same time. I haven't figured out a way to do that yet. So we can change things around and use some of these options that the fretboard gives us and use this pattern for the perfect fifth, we drop in our third, and we've got our G major triad. It's G because this is a G note here. And it's major because we have a major third in it. So there you go, a simple three note chord, a triad, that you can play to help you level up your rhythm skills. I mean, try playing that when someone else is just strumming or chugging away on power chords. It adds something to the sound, plus it helps you gain confidence up the neck. Now, here's something else that's really cool that's a byproduct of what we just did. If we take those same notes, the root, third, and fifth, and instead of playing them together in a chord like this triad, we play them separately, we've got something called an arpeggio. Remember with our triad, we couldn't play the third and the fifth on the same string at the same time. Well, with an arpeggio, that doesn't matter because we're playing the notes separately. And it doesn't matter what finger I use, right? That shape is still the same. So root, third, fifth gives us an arpeggio. And in this case, the root is a G, so it's a G major arpeggio. And we can keep going and find these all over the fretboard, kind of like we've been doing with the intervals. If we start down here on our lower G, there's our third shape, there's our fifth. But we also know we can do it here, right, with that open string. We can do our arpeggio really in two ways here, up the fretboard, 
and then back down the fretboard. Now going back to this G, we can play that arpeggio. Check it out, that triad is also an arpeggio. We could keep going and map out triads and arpeggios really all over the fretboard. They help you big time when it comes to knowing where you are on the fretboard. And they can help you solo without losing your place or hitting wrong notes or do some cool chord vamps while some other rhythm is going on. It's pretty cool, right? I love this stuff and there really is so much more that we've got to get to because these aren't the only intervals in the major scale. So let's talk about the other intervals in the major scale right now. First up is the major second, which is just two frets above the root. Pretty easy to find no matter where you are on the fretboard. Now going across the strings can be a little bit more difficult, but I want you to know where they are. This one is next string up and then down one, two, three frets. So I'm just kind of pretending like my index finger is fretting here, but it's really just over the nut. So you can see the shape and you can see that's you know a bit of a stretch. These middle two fingers here are not doing anything just to get them out of the way for the visual. This is what we're doing. Now that means a little bit more to us when we change our root. So now here I can play that major second interval a little more comfortable because the frets are closer together here. And then of course, if I'm going to play a major second on the second string, right? That shape doesn't hold up. We come in one and here we go. There's a major second and it's a lot more comfortable to play. It doesn't have that bigger stretch there, right? So that's actually the major second. Again, up one string, so from the third string to the second, and then down, in this case, just two. Any other string, and it's up a string, and then down, one, two, three. That's the major second. And of course, the most common example of the major second is in the song Happy Birthday, the very beginning. Right, just those first few notes. Right there. All right, next up, we've got the perfect fourth. This one is kind of embedded in the way we tune the guitar. Let's take a look. Starting from our root, if we move up five half steps, we have our perfect fourth. And moving up and across the strings is actually pretty easy because it's just at the same fret up one string, right? So here is our perfect fourth across the strings. And just as before, that holds up all over the place until we get to the second string. We have to come up one. So there is the perfect fourth starting on the third string, crossing into the second string. But now here's the perfect fourth from the second to the first, back to normal, right? Remember what we said about how we deal and when we deal with the second string. Now, a very popular way of thinking of the perfect fourth interval is, well, there are really two that I like to think of. First off, it's just the open strings, right? They're tuned a perfect fourth apart until we get to the third string because the second string is tuned a major third apart, right? But then back on top, the second to the first, that's a perfect fourth. So if you've got that sound locked in your brain, that's gonna help. But if you want a song, Amazing Grace, the first two notes, right there. So if you get that in your mind, you'll be able to recognize the perfect fourth when it comes up. All right, we've got two more to cover in order to get to our major scale. The major scale has seven tones in it, and if you're keeping track so far, we've covered the root, the major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth. We need the major sixth and the major seventh. Those two are coming up next. Now, the major sixth is up nine half steps. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. All right, but now moving across the strings is very helpful for us. We're not gonna play a chord with that stretch in it, right? But if we move across the strings, we're gonna end up skipping over the next string, the adjacent string, and then here is our shape. So it's skipping over the string and then back one fret. This is a major six. All right, now this shape is going to hold up anywhere except for where we land on or cross over the second string. 
So here we go, our first time at the second string if I'm on the fourth fret. So the six is this shape. That's where I raise that second string note up by a half step to accommodate, all right? And we're crossing if we start out on the third string. So same thing, we've got to take that default shape, if you will, and bring it up. Now, if you're looking for an example sound for the major six, you can try the MVC chime and of course find one that works well for you. But now we're gonna move on to the last interval that we need to build the major scale and that is the major seventh. The major seventh is 11 half steps. So that's one short of the octave above your root. So here it is on one string. But that's very useful, especially with a big interval like this to move across the strings. And we can really leverage what we know about octaves and just drop it down a half step. So this is a major seventh shape here. We move it to the fifth string. There's the octave, major seventh, move it to the fourth string. There's the octave. We've adjusted for the second string here. So drop that down. There's the major seventh. Same thing here, octave major seventh right so one song that i think of when it comes to the major seventh is take on me the 80s song by the group aha it's that first jump where we go take and on quite a jump and then here's the octave with these seven intervals, we now have everything that we need to find the major scale anywhere on the neck. Kind of like we did with the triad and with the arpeggio, we just have to put them together and we've got our major scale. Let's get to it. Let's start with our root on the fourth string and find our major second up two frets. We could find it down, right? But this is certainly a lot more convenient just to go up two frets from the root. And we know where the major third is. It's here, we know that shape. All right, the fourth is up one fret there, which means it's directly under the root. That little shape holds up. And then the fifth, our little power chord shape is there. Let's pause there and play them in order. We've got the root, major second, major third, perfect fourth, and perfect fifth. So really, we just need the six. That's the major six, the major seven, and then the octave. Now the octave is there. We know that from early on in our discussion, that shape, because we hit the second string, so we're adjusting up. Now, let's fill in the major six. That's here. Now, remember, we're on the second string, so we've got to account for that. And then we have our major seventh, which is one below the octave, right here. All right, so six, seven, octave. All together. Now, the cool thing is that when you really study all those shapes of finding intervals and you know where to find a major second, you'll have no trouble building out the, um, the first part. Then you know the major third, you'll have no trouble finding that in a scale, perfect fourth and fifth and so on. So that playing scales is less about patterns to you and it's more about the music and more about bringing out the intervals that the scale contains. Now listen, memorizing patterns can be helpful for sure. I'm not knocking it, but I definitely gained a deeper knowledge of the major scale by studying intervals. It made the scale usable to me. It helped me get inside it a little bit and it helped me find the sound that I'm looking for on the fretboard most of the time. So I want you to get familiar with each interval on its own. Spend some time drilling it and testing yourself with ear training exercises. That's an excellent way to do it. I teach the 3T system for ear training inside my membership. So if you remember, check that out. But ultimately, the deeper you know the major scale and its intervals, the better off you're going to be overall. But as a blues guitarist, I'm often going for a sound that's a bit grittier than the bright sound of the major scale, and that's where the next two intervals come into play. And the good news is that armed with the major scale intervals, these two are super easy to find. Let's take a look. Okay, here's a rule for you. You can make any of the major intervals a minor interval just by lowering it one half step one fret on the guitar. And this can make all the difference in the world just by changing one note. We're gonna do that with two intervals in particular that are very useful for us as blues guitars. Let's take a look. First up, the minor third. We know the major third is here. And I just said that we can find the minor third by lowering 
one half step? Well, we can do that here. So this is a minor third interval, right? If we do it from our lower G, it's here, right? This was a major third. This is a minor third. And of course, we could do it up the strings as well. We want that flexibility. We want to be able to do this from anywhere. So it's right here, right? If our major third is four half steps, then this is three. One, two, three. My favorite example of this, it's imprinted in me, is this riff. Black Sabbath, of course, that's Iron Man, and it's the first two notes. And yes, I'm bringing the entire power chord along with me, but I can really hear that jump, right? The vocal does it, the riff repeats that a lot throughout the song. It's a great one for me, but again, find an example that works out for you. The other interval that we're going to cover here is the minor seventh. It's found in the minor pentatonic scale, minor blues scale, dominant seventh chords. You can see why it's so widely used in the blues. So let's find that interval on the fretboard. The minor seventh is 10 half steps up from the root. It's a big distance. It's almost the entire octave, right? But here's something cool that we can do. We can also dip down into the lower octave and play a whole step down, two frets down, and we've got the minor seventh. We do that a lot in rock and blues, where it's dipping sort of below what you're thinking of as the root, and then back up, and we still get that cool sound, that gritty, bluesy, rocky sound. But now, how do we find it across the strings? Well, if we know how to find our octaves, we can use that and use that rule that it's two below to help us out. So here's the shape from the sixth string root, same shape from the fifth string root. Now the fourth string is gonna cause us to encounter the second string, so we've got to come up one, and there it is. Now, from the third string, is that, is that gonna work? No, we've gotta do the same thing and come up one because we crossed the second string, okay? Now, I'll get my fingers out of the way and you can see what's really happening there. It's skipping over the second string and coming up a fret. Let's put these intervals into action and see just how much of an impact they have. First, let's revisit a lick that's kind of representative of what I was playing in the opening jam. This is in the key of G and I'm focusing around this note on the third string, 12th fret. And for the most part, I was really playing around with intervals that had that major sound. You hear the major third throughout that jam. And after studying this lesson and digging into the intervals, hopefully you can recognize or start to get on that path of recognizing that as a brighter sound. But what if I chose to highlight the minor third and maybe even the minor seventh over that same track? Well, I put that together just so we can have a really cool contrast to compare the two, and here's what I came up with. Notice how emphasizing the minor versus the major sounds gave the lick a completely different sound. That's the power of intervals at work. So I really want to encourage you to find them on your guitar, learn them, and learn how to use them in the music that you want to get out. And if you want to go further and really level up your understanding of the fretboard, then I invite you to pick up the fretboard toolkit from BGI. It's completely free and packed with videos, lessons, and PDFs that will help you make sense of these 138 options on your fretboard. You can pick that up right over here. And until next time, practice smart and play on.